Okay, everyone, let's, let's have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Nelson. I'm the director for the Center for International Media Assistance in Washington, D.C. Um, I am here representing a group of people who have come together in a really, truly multi-stakeholder way to uh, talk about the future of the Internet. We represent a group called the um, uh, Open Internet for Democracy that um, uh, is composed of the Center for International Media Assistance, the Center for International Media Assistance, um, actually the Center for International Private Enterprise, the Center for International Media Assistance, and the National Endowment the, Na the National Democratic Institute. I'm, I always screw these names up every time I say them, so forgive me. But it's a group of people who come from different sectors to think about the, um, the issues that are involved in making the Internet a more open and participatory uh, Internet and, and governance process that involves people from around the world. And we are delighted that we have this opportunity to talk about this incredibly important topic today of the internet splintering into national um, pieces that undermine the, the very reason that the Internet Governance Forum was created in the first place. Um, the, as you know, this, this, this whole forum it has been going for the last 14 years that is, and trying to make the internet an inclusive and, uh, and participatory uh, process of governance that uh, values the open, connected internet that brings knowledge to isolated communities and helps um, the internet reach the far corners of the earth. It, it's, a, it's a system that um, brought knowledge and, um, and, and helped reduce poverty and help countries reach the information that they needed in order to develop and to thrive and to improve human progress. Yet today that, that internet and that vision of a democratically controlled internet through a multi-stakeholder pro process is under attack and a growing number of countries is being attracted to a, a, an approach that would create an internet that ends at national borders that becomes an instrument of social control and political suppression. So today we're gonna to be hearing the stories of how that is happening across the world and we've brought people from around the globe to talk about it. We initially had a really very good uh, gender balance on our panel but the uh, combination of no-shows and visas really undermine that, though we do have some important uh, 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 voices in this panel and some uh, important diversity in terms of geography. But I, I wanted to point out that we, we tried very hard to have a really gender balanced uh, panel and it, uh, we were, uh, we, we didn't, we, we were uh, stopped from that. So I, I'm sorry to, to report that. I'm gonna let our panelists start by introducing themselves and telling us where they're from and the organizations that they represent. And then we're going to have an, a, a conversation here at the front and we're going to involve the audi audience in that process. Uh, let's, let's start here on my, on my right. Um, Ephraim, you, you can introduce yourself and, and tell us where you're from and who you represent. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ephraim. I'm from Kenya. I work with Article 19, uh, working on freedom of expression and information across the world. Uh, we are a global organization which have done this for the last two years uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here so that we have this conversation to ensure that we have one united internet across the world. Thank you. Good morning everyone. My name is uh, Olga Kirilyuk. I'm uh, CEO and founder of the Ukrainian-based organization, uh, The Influencer Platform. We are working uh, on the protection of uh, digital rights and the promotion of the idea of uh, equal opportunities, uh, free and open internet. 
Uh, during the last year, I was also the ambassador of the Southeastern European Dialogue on Internet Governance, uh, and uh, now I'm also an incoming member of the executive committee of uh, this regional initiative. And uh, also, since a few years, I'm a founding member of the uh, Internet Freedom Network for the Southeastern Europe and Eurasia. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Walid Al Sakaf. Um, I am uh, here representing Sedetorian University, being a, a scholar at Sedetorian University's media technology and journalism departments. And um, I originally come from Yemen, so I bring expertise both from uh, uh, the north, global north, and global south. Uh, my own interests are uh, how the internet allows freedom of expression and how means of stifling the internet through censorship and other forms of re repression can, in fact, limit the potentials of the internet. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kudakwa Shaove. I'm with the Media Institute of Southern Africa, the Zimbabwe chapter. We work to promote media freedom in Zimbabwe and in the region with the cooperation of our sister chapters in four other Southern African countries. Um, we've started working on digital rights around 2015 in response to government um, actions <coughs> which sought to restrict uh, freedom of expression and access to information in online environments. And I'm also here as a fellow of the Joint uh, Open Leaders for a Democratic Internet uh, Program. So just to give you a sense of the kind of work that we've been doing, we have a, uh, a set of principles that have been worked out about the open internet that you can pick a copy up out our booth that is at uh, station number 50, uh, down in the second part of the um, open area where the uh, uh, different stalls are located. And it, we worked out the basic principles of what needs to happen in to, in to keep the, open, the internet open. And um, you might want to pick up a copy of this because I think it's a useful um, and, and practical uh, instrument to help understand what are the different, different components of that process. So today we're going to be looking first at, at the threats that come from the splinter net that is emerging in the world today and the, attractive, uh, the, the attractions that some countries are finding to the idea of closing down the internet at its borders in order to control people. Um, and I'm going to start with Walid to, to just give us a, a sense of how you see this happening, both in terms of the political uh, arrangements that are taking place as well as the technical side of it. Um, uh, are we getting to the point where this is actually going to be possible as, as a reality on the ground? And, and what does that mean exactly? Um, thank you. Let me start by saying that when the Internet came about, uh, it was a rather disruptive technology, something that governments are not used to. I mean, uh, many of you understand the decentralized nature of the internet, and so the centralized control of communications through the various uh, national establishments uh, had been used to the fact that you have a center node where you get to provide permission to access the various means of communication. But when the internet came about, that disrupted that, this, this control, and so the uh, reaction was to follow, to try to have a catch-up uh, stage where governments look into ways in which, okay, we have no technical control of how the internet runs, but we at least have some regulatory, I mean, we can impose regulatory measures. And so uh, in many countries around the world, including, for example, in the Middle East, where I come from, national governments have control of the internet service providers. So in one way or the other, whether they are private or public, they have uh, ultimate uh, decision on whether they shut down the internet uh, in, in a particular geographical location, uh, whether they censor it, whether they impose any throttling. And uh, we are a bit uh, further away from the Arab Spring, but we very much recall what happened at the time. So within borders, you have the ability to control access. Uh, the only thing that is a bit, um, optimal, let's say, hopeful is that there are more and more people that are aware of how one can, dis, let's say, circumvent forms of censorship through using the very essence of the technical features of the Internet. 
Then again came another wave uh, of governments reacting to this as well. So it's more to do with uh, um, um, you have a stage where you have an awareness of a new method and then you have the governments taking a step further to try and to limit the possibility of using that method. And I personally have gone through the experience of developing a circumvention software to help activists overcome censorship in certain parts, but then governments and, and others found a way to limit that access by blocking, for example, the ports of the VPN entries, and sometimes even using that in their advantage by surveilling uh, systems. So in other way, I mean, the, they see this as an entitlement being extended from the fact they are the so-called protectors of national security. So, um, unfortunately, we have trends to see uh, where we uh, realize that this is going to continue and this uh, cat and mouse chase will remain in place. There is no real one solution to how to deal with this, um, but this is a good beginning to begin to discuss why is this happening and how can we resolve it. Thank you, Wally. I want to turn to Olga now. You know, this, this area that we're working in here is one where um, we fall in the cracks between a, uh, a system of global governance and the system of national uh, controls. And uh, the internet is, is, has been devised to become a, a real public good at the global level yet we are struggling to figure out how to do this legally and pr procedurally. And you've looked at the legal uh, uh, thinking that goes behind the ideas of a multi-stakeholder system that uh, governs the internet as, and, and how, what is the role of the state and legal entities in that process. So give us your thoughts about um, the threats of this, uh, this breakdown in the internet and what uh, how you see this uh, from uh, your scholarship. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's indeed uh, not, uh, not an easy question and uh, there is no like, clear answer to, to this kind of question. But uh, to be honest, I believe that uh, the biggest problem is that uh, from the very beginning there is the assumption that digital space is something which is uh, existent uh, in purely technological uh, uh, space and purely technological terms. And uh, from this point of view, it is supposed to be regulated only by uh, technological uh, standards uh, and uh, it has nothing to do with the law and the legal regimes. Which is uh, not really true because uh, the digital space did not uh, uh, did not, uh, was not created uh, in the vacuum. It was uh, already embedded into existing uh, uh, social structures and uh, of course uh, uh, the states had a big role to play in uh, regulating uh, uh, everything which, is, uh, which has something to do with the uh, sovereign powers. So by no means we can say that uh, internet or sovereignty are like some stable notions. They are very dynamic ones and uh, they have to be developed with time and that's why once the internet uh, was created, uh, the, very, uh, the very nature of the sovereignty has been uh, challenged, and that's why states uh, had to, uh, with the flow of the time, to adapt to that. And as uh, Valid uh, uh, rightly mentioned, that uh, from the very beginning, the states did not understand the, the value and the very nature of the internet to regulate it uh, directly from the start. That's why it took some time. But, but now, when uh, the governments understand uh, the very value and those benefits and also those uh, dangers which the digital space uh, has in itself, they of course uh, want uh, to regulate it, but uh, it also has uh, its, uh, uh, its difficulties because uh, digital space uh, has a uh, borderless nature and it's very difficult to apply uh, territorial design uh, laws uh, into uh, regulating uh, such, a, such a borderless phenomena as uh, the internet is. At the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, the states uh, do have the jurisdiction within, the, within their territory, and that's why for them, whenever they try to put uh, the laws, they of course try to, try to like, limit those laws uh, by the uh, territory of their state, because just they can't uh, uh, extend their jurisdiction to, to the other states. And uh, on the other side, it is very complicated for them to agree on something on the international level, because it is very lengthy process, and it is very costly process. And uh, of course, uh, we can't say even that the states have a unanimous approach to how to regulate the digital space. And you, you come from a, uh, from a country, Ukraine, that is going through a massive transformation from a country that used to be part of the Soviet Union to today asserting its uh, uh, democratic uh, future. 
is the open nature of the internet uh, questioned in the power structure or by the people in Ukraine today? Do they want to be, to have this open system that uh, connects them globally, or is that a, an issue that it's uh, causing uh, concern or discussion? I would say the open nature is not even questioned by the governments because whatever restrictions they put in place, it is uh, all the time for the sake of the open internet, but just to protect some kind of security which has been uh, threatened by a uh, different uh, number of uh, external uh, threats. In our case, it was uh, uh, when uh, the restrictions were introduced back in uh, mid-2017, uh, we could not even uh, Imagine before that that something like that could happen in our country because Ukraine uh, was always a country of a free and very affordable internet and uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, internet service providers. We have uh, a very cheap uh, cost of the access to the internet. Uh, we have very uh, uh, knowledgeable people who know how to use uh, how to use the internet. And uh, when the restrictions were put in place and it was already the society was divided between two different camps like those uh, uh, who were like very much concerned about national security and could buy any uh, justification that the government was selling that uh, uh, we need to restrict and uh, we need, you need to give up a part of your freedom just for the sake of the national security, otherwise you are just uh, not uh, the good citizen of your country. And there were the others who were, selling, uh, who were telling, and uh, my organization was among, uh, among that, uh, that part of the civil society, we were saying that, uh, of course, national security matters, but when you start restricting, uh, uh, in that case, that was uh, freedom of expression online, you never know where, where where the government would stop because this is a very slippery slope once the government starts to put restrictions. It is very difficult to control uh, what uh, kind of uh, um, free speech they control and, uh, and when they would want to stop because then they would find another reason, another argumentation for that. Let's, let's turn to, to what's going on in Zimbabwe, uh, Kuda, and, and your experience in Southern Africa. Um, Africa has been being seen uh, recently to be implementing a variety of new ways of, sh of shutting down the internet and stopping people from accessing and using this, this, this instrument. And this seems to be a real threat to the progress that, uh, that Africa has made over the past decades. I mean, you know, we've had incredible development in Africa and, and real progress in some countries. And you come from a country where these, uh, these threats are, are really noticeable. Tell us what you think the the, the consequences of this splinter net will be for, uh, for Zimbabwe and for other parts of Africa. Um, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, so, like you're saying, I would like to start off with the fact that over the past decade, we've seen an increase in the number of Africans, specifically in the Southern African region, that now have access to the internet. This is uh, because of a range of factors. It's now cheaper to get a an entry-level smartphone, um, the use of social media bundles, the rise of technologies such as WhatsApp, Facebook, which have replaced more expensive and traditional means of staying in touch, such as voice communication and basic SMS. And this has also brought a threat, because in the past, uh, countries such as Zimbabwe and other countries that are concerned or that have governments that are concerned about what's happening in terms of free expression and access to information are now seeing the rise of these cheap, affordable and widespread communication tools as a threat to their control of the information society within their countries. So we most likely won't see the scale of a splinter net as we've seen in China and Russia uh, mainly because of things like resources and to a certain extent the know-how to actually, first of all, cut off the whole country from the global internet, as well as the resources to produce alternative versions of Facebook, Google, WhatsApp, and all these popular tools that we're seeing being used now. So what we have been seeing is in Zimbabwe, for example, and in Malawi, we've seen internet shutdowns and other forms of information controls around national um, events or events at a national scale that relate to political affairs such as uh, elections in Zimbabwe, in Malawi in April, as well as um, 
the social uprising in Zimbabwe in January, which led to a six-day internet shutdown. So those are sort of like the ways that we're seeing governments in that region sort of restrict what's happening in the internet space. They, they're not um, completely creating an alternate or parallel internet, but they are controlling what's happening on the global internet by restricting uh, information controls. And they're also using policy. An example of this is in Zimbabwe where the current uh, national ICT policy uh, from 2016 to 2020, uh, 2021, sorry, uh, ex actually um, talks about government's intention to shrink the number of international uh, internet gateways from uh, about five to seven to one. And this one internet gateway will most likely be controlled by government. So we're seeing the use of policy to change the physical structure of the internet in Zimbabwe <coughs> in a way that will um, give government the power to switch it on and switch it off as per need. And that type of, that type of action is being used else, elsewhere around the world. Article 19, where if or aim you, you work, you've, you've had specific examples of where this kind of policy has really reduced the ability of, of civil society to organize and to connect with each other during periods of crisis and during ma massive uh, changes that are taking place in Africa. You were talking yesterday uh, of, about Burundi where you had some examples of how this uh, manifested itself there. Tell us a little bit about how you see this, the, the threat that, uh, of, of, of a splinter net in the work you do. Thank you. So uh, the, regarding this, uh, the uh, get, gateways, the international gateways, similar example is Uganda where this year in uh, June, um, the government tried to reduce the number of IXPs and collapse them into one. Uh, that has its various risks. And then the policy that was uh, being drafted to uh, support this move uh, was drafted in a way that was imposing intermediary liability on the IXPs and anyone operating them, that they would be able to be liable for content, which is not best practice uh, when it comes to this. So such kind of actions um, have uh, led to uh, people being scared of the internet or being scared of using ICT. So basically just criminalization of ICT usage and making it risky to do your work. So uh, the specific example that, um, just building on what Kuda mentioned, is uh, uh, for those who monitored the 2015 Burundi crisis, uh, there was um, attempts at disconnecting Burundi from the world because of the human rights violations. Uh, and. Uh, that those attempts in a way, uh, for example, even um, there was first, uh, the first sign was the internet shutdown. There was an internet shutdown that disconnected the entire internet, uh, the entire Burundi uh, system from the internet, and not just internet, but also SMS and other um, telecommunication services. So in, 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 this is some of the risks that we see uh, in, in that, in that uh, uh, when this happens. But then uh, in Africa, um, uh, where I've worked m mostly, uh, we don't see like an alternative um, internet being built or, or something like that. It's more of uh, uh, disconnecting from the global internet. But then one example that happened and, and, uh, is um, recently, I don't, I don't know, uh, I think it was in April or, or, or March, there was some suggestion from the Ugandan ICT minister to come up with an alternative uh, Facebook for Ugandans. Uh, so if uh, this was after some conference between uh, uh, African and, and China uh, uh, Ministry of ICT officials. So uh, if, this, if we are building uh, and Facebook for, Facebook for, uh, for each country, Africa has 55 countries. Uh, so we're going to have to download 55 apps to, to communicate with all our friends in all those countries, if you have friends across the country. So it's just impractical if you want to keep uh, global trade to, uh, to ensure people keep working the way they, they, they wanna, uh, they're supposed to, to be working. So there's also that question of influence from various places. Uh, whenever there's those ministerial multilateral meetings or bilateral meetings, some of them unfortunately have had bad influences uh, on some of our countries 
which have less than 25% internet connection. So you can't start restricting uh, the, the, the internet for a country which has 20, less than 25% connection, or for example, Eritrea, which has 1% connection, or, or, or uh, Ethiopia, which is now opening up, but it was uh, a few years ago, it was in a much worse state with only 4% connection. So uh, it's, it's, it's working against bringing the people who are offline. Africa has one billion people, uh, most of them uh, offline, uh, around 70% of, of them offline. How do we bring them on, on, online? If we have these kind of policies which are not, or we're trying to introduce these policies from certain parts of the world which are not opening up uh, Africa for trade or for um, work on freedom of expression and, and human rights. Yeah, that's a really good um, segue into the, into the next part of the conversation. And as you point out, this, this can really be a, a, a set of breaks on progress for, for the development of, of, of many parts of the world. And it's uh, the knowledge and, um, and connection, connections that scientists and health workers and others get when, through the internet can if that slows down, it could really have a, a really negative impact on international development and the progress of democracy. At the same time, there are real problems that are happening on cyberspace, and there are real reasons that countries have to worry about um, the, the, the way that um, information and disinformation are, are, are moving in this space. And there are legitimate reasons sometimes to think that we have to find ways that these, uh, these systems, these, uh, these communication systems, the internet, has democratic controls that, are, um, that, that work and that are effective and that, that don't stop freedom of expression but allow um, the internet to serve uh, public interests. So I'm, I think we should turn now to thinking about what are some of the ways we might think about that. And, um, um, maybe, I, maybe I'll start with Kuda. What, what is your thinking on how uh, we might consider these, uh, these, this, this, this tension between the need for connectivity and the need for open systems and also uh, some of the real problems that may be necessary to find ways to um, uh, have democratic oversight over how this internet works? Uh, I wish he had gone first with someone else, but okay. Um, so from, from, from the work that we've done, um, from the readings that I've done, the issue that comes out is that it's less about states and big corporations looking for ways to approach or to solve or to address the threats that you identify. I'm guessing you're talking about how, for example, it's so easy to spread messages of hate over the internet now. It's cheap, it's affordable, it's widespread. But for me and the work that we've done, it's all about democracy. Um, the ways that people are controlling and regulating the internet right now is being done in a way to stifle democratic processes. Very few people are talking about how to secure the internet against genuine, legitimate cyber criminal activities or cyber security threats in, in, in that regard. But look at the number of countries in Southern Africa that have been working on different cyber legislation. We're talking about um, e-transactions and e-commerce legislation. We're talking about cyber security and computer crime legislation, and to a certain extent, data protection regulations. Most of the cyber security and cyber, um, cyber laws that are being drafted and that have been shared are really meant to stifle free expression, access to information, and genuine democratic um, participation. I think that f what we need is a platform where governments can come together with civil society because if we just leave governments to meet by themselves, we probably would get a situation where they end up sharing the negative ways that they've managed to clamp down on free expression and access to information. So 
we really we really need a platform that is more effective than the IGF because the IGF, like you're saying, this is the 14th edition, but we still, every time we meet, so next time we meet, would probably be at a situation where the need for solutions is much more dire than this year. So probably we need to revise the platform that brings together civil society and government to bring about meaningful engagement. Um, in one sentence, do I have a solution to this? No, I do not have a solution, but I think it's a solution that won't just come from one sector. It won't just come from the states or governments, but from several stakeholders coming together. So it's going back to this, uh, this vision that started the IGF of a multi-stakeholder governance system, but that it needs to be deepened and made more meaningful and stronger. And there, there are definitely some proposals out there that do just that. But it's a, it's a, a very important point. I wonder, uh, Olga, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on this, on this question of what do we do and how do we manage this and how do we build, how do we build uh, political will to have such a system in the world where there's so many, you know, um, also in a world that is increasingly moving toward authoritarianism and uh, one that where a lot of countries really just want to control their populations from top down. How do we do that? First of all, I think that it's not only the authoritarian regimes that want to have their stand uh, and their control on the internet, but also the democracies, which is which is very interesting because, uh, let's say, these uh, <clears throat> two different regimes would be using different um, sources under which they will be saving uh, their regulation uh, to their population, but still they will be targeting uh, uh, the same goals. I think uh, it is high time to have the alignment of the... Um, of the legal uh, framework uh, that we have and uh, of the digital space, because so far we very often tend to oppose this, uh, these two uh, uh, phenomena and to say that they have, nothing to, uh, they have nothing in common just because the cyberspace has to develop in its, in its, own, uh, in its own pace and has nothing to do with the regulation. And um, I think uh, that uh, we need uh, to make a choice that uh, it's it's only because uh, the internet is interoperable and we have nothing like interoperability in the international law when we have, uh, and also among lots of national jurisdictions. So now we have to make a choice. It's either we realign the cyberspace along the territorial borders of national jurisdictions as it is happening now. That's why we are talking about national authoritarianism, about split internet, about balkanization, whatever you call it. Or we have to work collectively and uh, elaborate uh, uh, the interoperable framework, uh, legal framework, which would be regulating uh, these uh, uh, different uh, different types of relationships, which uh, which have this, uh, which have uh, which either are connected with cyberspace or have uh, some element, this digital element uh, in them. Uh, at the same time, I don't think, uh, like I've had at some of the panels during this IGF, that we need more dialogue, we need more discussion. Uh, I don't think we need more dialogue. The IGF is happening for the 14th year in a row now, and we had a lot of dialogue. We, have, we know all these challenges. We put them again and again, year after year, but uh, nothing is changing. We need to, to come to the uh, stage when we move to the solutions from just the dialogue and the discussions. And uh, for this, like 14 years ago, there was a lot of illusion that multi-stakeholderism can change the world, that uh, this model of, govern of governance can be uh, opposed uh, to the um, classical multilateral model of governments. Uh, which existed uh, between the states. Nowadays, I think it's more about collaboration between uh, two of these models, because the states in themselves, they have the, the normative power, they can uh, make, uh, the, they have the law enforcement, they can make uh, the regulations uh, being implemented and, uh, and working. At the same time, the multi-stakeholder community has the necessary expertise and has uh, uh, and has accumulated in itself a lot of uh, a lot of uh, knowledge in from different perspectives uh, from uh, technical perspective uh, from academical uh, from civil society uh, practice so it has to be done all together let's say for example if uh, there are concrete ideas not just the discussions that we leave the panels with with nothing just concrete ideas which come up here at IGFs let's say and then they are brought back to the governments but in some very much feasible deadlines and then uh, and then those things are are being uh, set up at the regu um, regulatory level, 
then, then there is a way that those regulations which are being adopted, they make some sense and uh, that uh, they really correspond to the digital reality we are living in. That's, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, Ephraim, do you want to say anything on this from the, the, the standpoint? Okay, well, why don't we open it at, uh, to, uh, or Wally, do you want to say anything yeah, on this? Yeah, go. go. Very quickly, I'd like to say what we should not do uh, uh -huh. instead of what we should do. Uh, the internet has worked very well so far. I mean, we have what we call uh, self-governing institutions. Uh, you know, the IETF, uh, for example, the domain name system, for example, the IP addresses the distribution of that as well. And so there are standards in place that make it work function very well. It's dangerous for governments to intervene in the process. It will cause a massive rupture of the network. And not to forget, the internet itself has brought so much common good. So there's a global commons that we all share on the internet. And there's also the private goods, which countries can have through the internet access services that they provide. Let's not mix those together and lump them as one. I mean, the internet's main value was the global commons. So that's something if we remind over and over uh, to the institutions that would like to impose what is called sovereignty on the net or the cybersphere uh, would be very valuable for us to remind. That's, that's really helpful. And, it, and it's, it's kind of a positive uh, and hopeful outlook that you both have outlined here, that you all three have outlined, that we, we know a lot. We have a really important asset that we need to maintain and protect and that we have the expertise and, and people to do it. So there's a, there is a hope for this point of view. It's nice in this world we live in right now to have some uh, ideas of hope. We have a first question here. Can you introduce yourself? And Absolutely. Um, hello, good morning. My name is Max Senges. I work for Google. And uh, I wanted to react to Olga's last observation that we have come together for 14 times and that, that, there is ti uh, that it's time to evolve the system. Um, and I um, back to understand you in that direction because you said, ah, you know, it's not working. I don't think it's not working. I, in fact, I think it's the worst system that we ever have except all others. So um, uh, it's close to democracy and, and other um, uh, means of governance that they're not perfect. But I do think um, that you touch on an, a very important point, and that is there is a growing pain that we all feel that we need to get to solutions and that we need to get um, to the next generation of internet governance. And um, along those lines, I wanted to propose that um, this topic in particular, which uh, seems to have a very strong zeitgeist and momentum, is worthy of a dynamic coalition to uh, actually organize the work on a more continuous basis than just to check in every year. Uh, having that said, I do think that the role of the IGF is to set, set the agenda, to frame the issues in a way so that we can meet after this um, session and say, okay, how, what do we actually do? So I encourage that those who are interested to actually do something gather in the, um, on the, the side of the um, panel to uh, see what we can do and then to monitor what is going on. And that was also something that I think is happening in a decentralized manner but could be much more organized than the conversation contract for the web is in fact um, a, a nice instrument to connect a good bunch of metrics and measurements and monitoring around. Thank you. Ashid, yeah, please. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Andrew Kempling, 419 Consulting. Um, to give a slightly different perspective and maybe challenge the, uh, uh, the pre prevailing view of the uh, uh, panel. Um, I, I contend at the moment that the so-called global internet is, is largely dominated by uh, sort of US cultural norms and standards, and dare I say, US-centered uh, companies. Um, and it doesn't reflect well the different values elsewhere. Uh, so for example, in Europe, with a, a much stronger preference to data privacy, uh, compared to the US. Um, and so I'd argue that if, if it continues as is, um, so, the so-called splinternet is both inevitable and necessary, uh, at least on a regional level, to allow different cultural norms and standards to reassert uh, themselves. Otherwise, we continue down a path of increased centralization and all-pervasive uh, corporate surveillance, uh, which I think is hugely damaging 
uh, for democracy uh, uh, and other values. Uh, the alternative, to give a more positive spin on it, though, uh, is that you need much more uh, international political and policy input uh, into setting things like internet standards. Uh, so the discussions this week are fantastic, um, but most of the stakeholders here weren't present in Singapore last week when the IETF met. Uh, now, the IETF sets the te technical standards, but behind that makes its own decisions on policy. Um, so I think what would be a far more valuable development would be to have the IGF to assert itself as the client that directed the uh, requirements onto bodies like the, the IETF, rather than the IETF so acting in isolation um, and technocrats making decisions uh, that, that, that overcome the preferences of Democrats. Okay, thank you. Let's, uh, let's move over here, and we have, we have two. We'll take the next two. So you start. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bertrand de La Chapelle. I'm the Executive Director of the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Two, two comments quickly. One, it, whenever we talk about splinternet fragmentation and things like that, we need to really, really make the distinction between the layers. What Walid was talking about in terms of the governance that functions, the IETF, the World Wide Web Consortium and the rest, that is governance of the internet. For governance on the internet, what people do with the internet, this is a completely open space and this is where the challenge is. Let's not touch the underlying uh, thing and the spreading of uh, gateways and so on is indeed tampering with the architecture and we have to take into account whether this is diminishing the resilience. Even apart from the control, it is an architectural question. The structuring of the cyberspace of application, let's be honest, there is an enormous structuring of the cyberspace of applications. When you see the fight between the content providers who are setting up the Apple Plus, the Hulu, the uh, Netflix, and so on, and they have their own programming, it is a structuring. Is it a good structuring? Is it not a good structuring? You have applications on Android that do not exist on an Apple um, um, app store. These are also structuring things. What we're talking about, and the real challenge for the Internet Governance Forum, is the legal structure that applies the governance on the internet, what are the rules, what is the respective responsibilities of private entities, governments, etc. And here I want to piggyback, and that's the second point, with what Olga was saying, which resonates tremendously with what we do, because this was the main message of the third conference that we had in Berlin uh, here in, um, in June. The alternative is indeed do we take cyberspace and reimpose the exact territorial boundaries of legislations on a structure that is fundamentally cross-border, or do we go, and I'm very happy that she used the term, towards legal interoperability? And I want to make a distinction here. Just like we have um, technical standards, we need policy standards, but we need something more. We need standards for policy making, which is a different layer. It's the architectural approach of governance that is an institutional challenge. And at the moment, to finish, we are moving from techno euphoria to techno doom, where everything is going wrong and, and there's only abuses everywhere after having thought that the internet was going to change the world, just like actually people were saying about the telegraph in the Victorian internet, for those of you who have read the book. We are now seeing a flurry of initiatives for setting rules, and I'm purposefully not using the word regulation because the private sector and the governments are setting some rules, but because they're not coordinated, we're actually increasing the conflict of laws and the potential tensions. So the challenge is that we move in the direction of understanding that this is an institutional question and how do we go towards legal interoperability is the real good question, I think, that we should address. Very, very helpful comment. Thank you very much. And we have uh, this lady All there. All right. Thank you. My name is Tobe Gilema Timbe from Zimbabwe. And I would like to say that the, the, the way I see it is that technology is moving at a very fast and accelerated rate, more than um, the, the way African countries are developing with respect to respect itself for human rights. So you find that where the paranoia is coming from within the African continent is specifically coming from the fact that 
African governments cannot stand their citizens enjoying human rights, like, for instance, freedom of assembly and association. So you find that within our context, you find that when there's going to be like a planned demonstration, for instance, it's going to be done on WhatsApp, or there's going to be a tweet or something like that, and it'll be like a fell fire, and you have people that are gathering and things like that, and that can, African governments cannot stand that. So you find that even as much as we're discussing the issue of the internet, the issue is we need to go back to the issue of how are human rights being respected within the context of African countries or, or, or whichever developing countries. Once we are able to go backwards and step back, not as fast as the rate at which the internet is developing and technology is developing, we can be able to really troubleshoot and have a much more effective discussion on how to actually uh, promote an open internet. So, yeah. Very useful comment. Do, do we have anyone on the panel who would like to respond to any of the comments that have been made so far, and then we'll take another round? Anybody? Yes, please. Kuda? Um, just a brief um, uh, comment uh, on the second comment we received about the – thank you for spinning around the argument about the splinter net. It's, it's really useful. But what I would like to say is that in as much as it's – an internet developed by American-based corporations and exported to the rest of the world, the rest of the world has done what it could to make that American export very much a piece of their own thing. Look at the content that comes from Africa, for example, it's very much about what's happening in Africa. So I think it becomes a slippery slope if we then say, well, we now need regional internets or Things We definitely do need content that comes from each region that speaks to the audiences there. But to then say we need it at a structural level, that might actually be a bit tricky. I, I think it, uh, the content justifies how we're using this American export. Pali, do you want? Yeah. Yes, uh, in reference to the uh, notion of uh, the layers and not to touch the bottom two layer, let's say the network layer and I mean the physical link layer. Um, the problem here is that in, in some instances, the top layers where you have the protocol and the application layers, these are beginning now to change so rapidly and so drastically for some countries to the degree that it's almost simple to sh shut down the internet and keep it in, in bound. And this is a, a typical example is China, for example, where you have Weidu and others that are very already well national, I mean, nationalized to a degree that any single app, I mean, member who is you know, posting or reading can actually be more or less uh, surveilled. And so the thing is that if we totally abandon the idea, the risk, that happens in the long run and think, okay, everything will be okay, um, I mean, uh, in the, since the technology works and fine, uh, then we may wake up one day and realize, oh, now we no, no longer have any layers. It's all now becoming more and more nationalized. It's not a distant uh, possibility. On the other hand, if we constantly look into solving the top problems of the top two layers, then we can slowly begin to show the case that the, the, there is much more, let's say, to get or to gain from being a globally connected network than it is to become a sovereign uh, cyber network. So looking at them in, in a more, let's say, a combined way is always good uh, for the sake of the future. Uh, thanks, Bertrand, and uh, we've had this conversation with Bertrand before uh, about uh, the layers, and, and just to build on to what Walid is saying and, and, and Bertrand about the different layers, uh, the problem being uh, the, top, the top layer, uh, especially the content, uh, uh, legal uh, interoperability than harmonization because various countries have different um, uh, legal uh, and social uh, histories, so we can't say harmonization, we'd rather interoperability. Uh, and uh, on, 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 on the issue about um, the infrastructure layer, that's where now we think, I think we need to fight more together in a uh, multi-secular manner uh, that um, we ensure that we remain united because the, f the, the more united we are, the better our companies operate, the better our work as, 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 as human rights defenders as, as government is in terms of uh, coordination. So that's something which I, I'm just trying to spark a conversation with Bertrand uh, on, on 
um, a previous conversation we had recently. Yeah, just, just a two finger. One on Walid. I didn't mean that one should be prioritized over the other. It's, you're absolutely right that the two should be continued. I just highlighted the distinction. Uh, and and in the second, on the second comment, I want to reiterate something that is extremely important is legal interoperability is not harmonization. It is not harmonization. It's precisely the opposite of harmonization. And the bottom line is that we need to do for the set of heterogeneous governance frameworks, public, private, to make them interoperable, what the protocols for the internet and the protocols for the World Wide Web did to create the internet and the World Wide Web. The TCP IP enabled heterogeneous networks to be interoperable. HTML, HTTP enabled heterogeneous databases and information structures to be interoperable. We need protocols for interoperability in governance systems. Thank you, first of all, for a very interesting talk. My name is Veronica Thiel. I'm an associate with a local NGO called Algorithm Watch. Um, really interesting things coming up and brains going really fast. But first of all, the notion that the internet is self-governing on a certain level has just been recently disproven by the fact that the .org company is being sold off and nobody really had any say in that what happened there. And I can somehow lifting the price restrictions for .org domains. The accountability there is not there in the sense that who, do, who got to vote on it, so to speak. This is very much driven by an American or neoliberal for-profit motive, and we haven't sorted that. But coming to something that Olga said about um, you know, not only authoritarian governments using these kinds of measures, um, for me the question is, is there a way, or is it even legitimate, to say, we can shut down certain parts of the internet in case of national emergency. Um, and the abuse example I'm going to give there is in 2011, the riots in London when I was living there, um, the government shut down the BlackBerry network, messenger network, because it was said that all the rioters were organized through that network. And obviously, that's the same thing that people did, China did in Hong Kong. And you can't really do that if you claim this to be a democracy. But on the other hand, you can argue Yesterday, we, um, at the discussion around spread of misinformation yesterday afternoon, there was somebody from Kenya, I think, who said the spread of rumors is so malicious that we have to do something about it. So how do we square that? Is there a way that we can use criminal law to shut down, you could argue, criminal association via network messaging like happened in the riots in London? Oh, yeah, exactly. So what, what kind of measures can we take that ensures we keep the balance between freedom of speech, freedom of ex assembly expressions, and so on and so forth, while shutting down clearly malicious, threatening movements that use the internet? Thank you. Good question. Um, do we have one more? Or yeah, yeah. What, where did that come from? Are you here? Oh, yeah, so let's go down there first. Yeah. Thank you so much. My name is Adrieli. I'm a lawyer from Brazil. And I thought it was very interesting, a comment by Olga that she highlighted between the difference uh, of government, uh, democratic governments and tyrannical governments that they all use, uh, web, uh, use legal instruments to suspend the internet and etc. So my question for all the panelists would be, um, what, how is, how the suspension works, so in terms of legal aspects, as I'm asking as a lawyer, because in Brazil we also had some suspended services uh, for not complying to judicial order, for example, because of encrypted messages. They were, not, uh, um, they were not given to the law enforcement, and then the judiciary suspended an application. So my question would be, how is this division between the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary when they suspend internet services. Okay, one more, uh, with this gentleman right here. Hi, Vittorio Bertola, sorry. I was prompted to join the discussion by Bertrand's comments uh, because, well, first of all, I, I'd really like to make a point that this matter is really different depending on where you come from. So uh, I appreciate the point of view of, of the African people here and why they, it's like that. From the European viewpoint, I think it's still exactly the opposite. So the pressure we now see in Europe to restore some kind of 
national sovereignty over the internet is exactly because we feel like we have been losing democracy in Europe because of the, the fact that several things are now decided by American companies outside of any reach of, of our democratic institutions. And uh, there were, actually, there, there were, there, I mean, in, I was in another panel in which uh, the, there was uh, this person recounting the fact of an, an African immigrant in Germany being harassed because of a picture that was posted, posted on Facebook with hate comments and, and no one being able to take it off because Facebook insisted that this was behind, inside their terms of, of, of the community standards and no one has a say in Europe on Facebook's community standards. So, so that, that's exactly the point. So I'm, I, I agree with Bertrand, we could look for, let's say, an international way of making legal interoperability work. But I think we, as a, we as an internet community, have, we've been involved in this, we've had 15 years to, to get to here and we, we failed. So I think now this is why there, there is outside pressure on the internet community to do something different and I don't think we have time to wait for another international solution. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna let the panel Respond quickly, we'll start with Olga, since the question is often directly to you. Yeah, just quickly about the shutdowns. I don't think that uh, shutdown is uh, a right response at all because um, it's very often happening in uh, the situations in, and in the context of, uh, of conflicts on the, uh, of, in the countries uh, which are not, uh, why not really everything is going smoothly. That's why uh, when you shut down completely the network, of, of course you might have the very good uh, target uh, as, as the government. You might uh, want to, to stop uh, spreading uh, the, uh, the hate speech or the, like, uh, to stop uh, people who are involved in the terroristic activities uh, talking to each other, but at the same time you are blocking uh, the ways uh, to talk to each other for other people who might be in danger in this, uh, in this same situation and they also lose maybe their only and uh, last uh, result, last hope uh, how they can connect to each other, how they can communicate that they are safe, or maybe even this, uh, this type of communication could uh, save uh, somebody's lives. That's why I don't think this is an option. Even, uh, even the blocking is not an option because for that case you will always find the circumvention tools and, uh, and uh, that just makes, uh, in many cases, makes the population uh, much more... Um, poses it much more on the other opposite end uh, to the government and uh, makes them even like more angry with, with what they can expect from the government. There is no trust, while there should be trust between, uh, between the government who is supposed to represent the citizens and like the citizens who could expect the proper level of protection for themselves. On the question about the, uh, how it is um, from the executive and judicial point of view, I mean, uh, the state is the state. Whatever laws, it, whatever laws and rules it puts uh, into play within their country, they have to be observed. That's why this is happening. And it's good at least when it's happening through the court, not only when it's happening by the executive uh, decision uh, or like voluntary law accepted, because uh, at least when there is a court, you have some more hope that this is going to be happening in a more legitimate way than just by the executive order. Do you want to... Um, just to say that it's necessary for us to understand that uh, the uh, cyber space, cyberspace sovereignty is, in my opinion, not possible. Not possible because of the reasons stated below. So what is necessary is for states to be seen as a stakeholder in this process for a global good that would allow both uh, the user and the state to both be represented. And there are different models to do that. And this is, the IGF in itself is one model that where we can take. There are no easy solutions, but to consider it as a state responsibility only is a very dangerous precedent. If I am, do you have anything? Um, so just uh, on the content uh, issue, I would propose on the issue about legal operability, uh, use of mutual legal agreement treaties, MLATs, the system works when it comes to other criminal issues or other issues that are not criminal, uh, extradition and, and stuff like that. So if someone um, uh, does a crime and is hiding in a country that is in the system, the MLAT system, the, it, that works. Uh, why wouldn't that work in, in this uh, uh, global digital age, I think it's something which we need to use more uh, when it comes to the content issue. But then uh, when it comes to the uh, infrastructure issue, I will, uh, my, my previous comments are uh, stand. Um, I, don't, I don't really have anything in the way of closing remarks besides what I've said and what has been well shared by other panelists and I thank you. Um, for allowing me to be here. I yeah. Well, it, it, I just want to point out that two of our panelists are from the Open Internet uh, Leaders Program that we set up as part of the Open Internet for Democracy initiative, and it, uh, Olga and Kuda, and it shows 
that there are leaders from all over the world that can participate in this debate, and we're trying to increase the number of voices from the global south and other parts of the world that come to the IGF, that are part of this process, that get their perspectives in, and who can learn from each other about how to manage these very complex issues. And we want to try to expand that community of people because their voices can really help change the way this internet is governed. We all, I think, recognize that it is not ideal at the, at the, at the current time, and we need to find ways to improve this system and make it work for humanity. And that's what we've been trying to work on here, and I really thank the time that you've spent with us. Thank you for the time you've spent with us. We hope we can continue the conversation afterwards, and do visit the booth if you want a copy of the principles and, some, and to learn about the work that we've been doing. Thank you so much for coming.